second readings from the Gospel of John, I mean, sorry, Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, verses 1 through 3, and verses 11 through 32. This might be a familiar story to some of you. That is found on page 78 in the New Testament portion of the Pew Bible, if you wish to follow along. Listen again to the Word of God. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to the fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare, but here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandal, sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his, el his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf, because he got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him, but he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Before we get started, I have a brief PS to last Sunday's message about easy answers. I mean, the question of suffering, evil, theodicy, that is a pretty heavy, weighty Subject, And I know it is because it brought up some tough moments from my own life and ministry. And I know it was for some of you because you told me so. Maybe at, right after the service or in conversation this past week or messages or emails or simply without even words and just looking eye to eye. While hopefully debunking some of our easy uh, go-to easy answers I want to highlight a different answer real quick that might sound easy, it might sound simple, but if given with the appropriate humility and compassion, 
sometimes it's the only answer we can give, and that is, I don't know. I want you to know that it's okay to say, I don't know, because I don't know. Wrestling and struggling with evil and tragedy is much more authentic than quick bumper sticker platitudes. That's my PS. Today's subject, though, is a bit like easy answers, but it's actually an easy response. And that is to hold on to grudges. The Gospels are full of people with grudges. Jesus' parable from Luke 15 is probably one of his most well-known stories of all. And it shows us what life can be like free from grudges. Right, it's commonly referred to as the parable of the prodigal son. There's quite a bit of disagreement on whether or not that's how we should refer to it. After all, a rebellious son is nothing special. So why should he get top billing? Going back to the first message in this Lenten series, we talked about temptation, and we looked at a Rembrandt sketch. And today we have a fuller developed painting that's included in your bulletin insert. Uh, this is one of countless works of art inspired by the parable. In many ways, it captures the heart of the story in this one piece, right? There you have the filthy, barefooted son on his knees, embraced by the arms of his, of his father. The father, not the son, is the true hero, if that's the right word, of this story. It's hard to believe it was five years ago, but that's when we spent the Lenten season studying Timothy Keller's book, The Prodigal God. And if you've become part of this church since then, or started attending worship or online since then, I'll just say it's a must read. If you've grown up in church, or you've been around church for a while, you've probably heard a sermon or two, or 50, on the prodigal son. If you're brand new to the faith, there's a good chance you've at least heard the phrase prodigal son somewhere before. And so allow me to recap a few of the key details of the story, some of which might sound overly familiar to you. And if that is you, just try to put yourself in the shoes of Jesus' audience or maybe someone who's come to church for the first time or maybe the first time in a long time and maybe has never heard this before. Because that's the kind of attention that these parables, even the well-known ones, deserve. From the beginning, what we see throughout this parable are numerous examples of when the father could have easily created and held on to a grudge for the rest of his life. There are so many examples of broken cultural norms. All right, it's been said many times that the son asking for his inheritance early was the equivalent of telling his father, I wish you were dead. How else do you get an inheritance? It was a shameful thing to do. It was shame the father had to live with. Next, the son had to then liquidate that inheritance. In other words, the property he received, he sold it off. And every day, the, the, the father, the older brother, were reminded of that shame as they watched a new neighbor work on what was their former land. And so the story is already quite astonishing by this point. Clearly, this dad was not a helicopter parent. He was not trying to be his son's best friend. And he was not trying to buy his son's loyalty by appeasing his demands through his old tantrum. The son was probably too old at this point for a grounding. He was grown. And he was making some grown yet foolish decisions. And the dad simply lets him. 
hard to do. Culturally, though, this is also a little difficult to relate to. I mean, these days, most parents, right, we're striving to raise young adults so that when the day comes, they can leave the nest, fly on their own. Right? It's the norm for kids to grow up and eventually leave. But back then, that was not the norm. Children stayed as adults and lived there as part of the family business. Households included multiple generations, and the expectation was that children would grow up and stick around to take care of their parents in their old age. And so the younger son demolishes all of those cultural norms, and the dad, who in our eyes would have every right to hold on to a grudge or a tin, simply does it. This is where N.T. Wright believes this story should be called the parable of the running father. Right? The story implies, right, that the father never stopped keeping watch for his son. Maybe out of his wisdom, he knew how everything would play out, and it was just a matter of time. But no one with a grudge would keep that kind of a lookout. The father also would have been wearing a long robe. So his response of running in that robe would have been seen as most undignified and probably pretty clumsy. No one with a grudge would make themselves look that foolish. Lastly, the forgiveness, the grace, the restoration of the younger son back into the family would have been completely unexpected. And no one with a grudge could have made all that happen and just let all of that go. Wright says his lavish welcome is, of course, the point of the story. Jesus is explaining why there is a party, why it's something to celebrate when people turn from going their own way and begin to go God's way. Because the young man's degradation is more or less complete, there can be no question of anything in him commending him to the Father or to any other onlooker. But the father's closing line says it all. This, my son, was dead and is alive. He was lost and is now found. It's important because this reinforces that Christianity is not about works righteousness. We cannot earn our way into heaven or salvation or into a right relationship with God. That's only possible through our Heavenly Father's graciousness and our repentance. And amazingly, if the Father in this parable is the symbol of our Heavenly Father, it's done without a grudge. He's actively on the lookout for us, eagerly expecting us, and completely willing to throw aside all customs to welcome us home. His moving from heaven to earth was as undignified as it gets. And yet, he did it. And while there is no grudge on the Father's part, grudges do exist in Luke 15. The chapter begins describing the scribes and Pharisees as grumbling. It's always a good word. And this is symbolic, too, of the older brother. Ben Long is a frescoist, and one of his works is displayed at the chapel of the prodigal at Montreat College in North Carolina. Uh, Mo I know Montreat because it holds youth conferences each summer, of which I've attended numerous times as a youth and as a leader. It's one of my favorite places, but I can't recall if I've ever been inside this chapel. I guess I have a good reason to go back now. But in his fresco, which is also included in your insert, 
you'll see the older son, the mother, and the father and younger son forming kind of the shape of a triangle. You have the mother in the top left looking at the older son. You have the father looking upon his younger son in his arms right there in the middle. And the older son to the right is looking at his father and brother. One commentator noted the father's hand is raised in thanksgiving. And the fatted calf is slaughtered in the background. The anxiety, resentment, and restoration that drive the energy of the parable leap out of the plaster as they overwhelm the viewer. So it made me ask this week, why do we get grudgy in situations like this? The spell check does not recognize the word grudgy, but it works. I'm going to roll with it. Why am I tempted to withhold grace from someone who disgusts me? Or why am I reluctant or refuse to celebrate someone who disgusts me and makes that turn in their life, offers that repentance, and genuinely changes? Why am I quick to dismiss them and question their motives? Right? It can't be real. I'm grudgy when I do that. And that's not right. I think there's something about already being in a group or kind of like a club. And even though we shouldn't feel proud or arrogant for being part of the body of Christ, sometimes we get too full of ourselves and we think we get to decide who gets to be a part of the body and who doesn't. This happens in many areas of life. For example, I don't believe I've yet mentioned my relatively, at least from here, my relatively newfound obsession with Formula One motor racing. I'm not alone. The sport's been around since 1950. And for over 95% of my life, I didn't care. Well, bring on a pandemic where we watched just about everything on Netflix. Chelsea and I were one of many who watched and devoured a series called Drive to Survive. It's a documentary series slash reality TV kind of deal about F1. And it's incredible. I will give you the language warning right up front. But I'll say this, that F1's popularity, especially within the United States, is skyrocketing because of this so much that they've added a second Grand Prix in the United States this year in Miami. They're going to add a third one in Vegas next year. And hey, and you, you may not care about F1, but if you love golf, the same company is doing it with the PGA, so get ready. You would think that a fringe, kind of a niche sport would welcome all the eyeballs and attention it can get. And, and many, I would say most are. But you might be surprised. And there are those in these situations that are referred to as the gatekeepers. They're the ones who have been watching since 1950. Or at least prior to 2019. They didn't need Drive to Survive to expose them to the sport and get them excited. It's always been their thing, right? They've been around it for a long time. And now here come all these idiots and novices with zero or maybe hardly any kind of knowledge of its history, and they get all kind of grudgy. Sadly, we can get the same way in church. I'm not picking on this church or anyone in here necessarily. It's a general broad statement because it applies across the board. It's human nature. We get grudgy within church when the wrong kind of people join as members. Right? We only want the right people, the people that we invite, or the ones that we approve of and profess their faith. Daniel G. Deffenbaugh writes, reflecting on the older son's reaction, 
it is instructive for those of us who have long been part of the church, who have been with the Father always, to recognize various aspects of our own sinfulness. Pride, jealousy, anger, and self-righteousness are all the more appalling when we know that as beneficiaries of God's grace through our baptism, we should be engaged in the rejoicing that accompanies the return of a prodigal. Yet sin mars our redemption and hinders our work of sanctification. We assume the worst in others. Like the elder son embellishing his brother's story with prostitutes, our jealousy often compels us to exaggerate the shortcomings of those in our midst. We think of how certain turns of events might affect us instead of how they might benefit the well-being of the body of Christ. We cling to our tried and true ways of doing things, wishing that someone would simply acknowledge our faithfulness, if not with the fatted calf, then at least with a young goat. Can you see how much or how many things grudges get in the way of? Grudges work directly against God's work of reconciliation. Grudges change how we look at the Father. And grudges change how we look at our brother and sister. While grace is overflowing over there, and while forgiveness and reconciliation and restoration are happening over there, grudges create barriers. Barriers that are ineffective of stopping the Father's grace. So what good do they do? As Jesus moved closer to Jerusalem, as we're walking through Luke in this series, and as he had to know what was awaiting him, it must have been really hard not to get grudgy towards the people there and the people around him. Not to become cynical. Not to become resentful. By learning of God's incredible, costly, self-sacrificing grace, completely free from grudges, as shown through the, through the Father in this parable, we see the kind of love that moved Jesus down the road and to the cross. We see the life Jesus intends for us when we move on from grudges. It's in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit.